Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada's third city, just a few miles north of the U.S. border. Yesterday, a brash settlement on the edge of nowhere. Today, one of the most beautiful cities in North America and the busiest seaport on Canada's Pacific coast. As the previous quote demonstrates, it is hardly a secret that Vancouver has changed significantly over its history. In investigating two sites, Granville Island and the waterfront of Canada Place, I hope to show you not just that change has occurred, but also to demonstrate the more subtle impacts that these changes have had on the waterfront, who can use it, and how. To begin our investigation, let us wander under the Granville Bridge down towards the waterfront of Granville Island. Over the course of a hundred years or so, Granville Island has been literally created out of nothing. In the early 1900s, little more than a sandbar and a railway bridge existed on the site which Granville Island now occupies. Rapidly, this area became a place of work for many, with mills and other industrial establishments making up a large proportion of the businesses operating there. Even within a few moments of arriving at the waterfront, we can see that this history of industrial use has significantly changed in the modern day. Gone are the industrial establishments, along with the piers and the barges that used to load and unload throughout False Creek. In their place, marinas filled with the yachts and sailboats of the ultra-wealthy compete for space with tourist-aimed establishments such as boat rentals, fishing charters, and restaurants. Also gone, it would seem, are the working-class people themselves. Instead, members of the city's middle and upper classes, characterized by authors such as Rob Brownie and Annabelle Vaughn as the city's leisure class, stroll the seawall sporting fleece jackets and iPhones. Another group of people who are conspicuously absent from this idyllic scene are Vancouver's poorest residents, the usual litany of panhandlers, shopping carts, and people sleeping on cardboard are nowhere to be seen. In part due to the lack of working people and of poorer residents, I truly got the sense that the downtown peninsula of Vancouver and the area surrounding it, such as False Creek, has, in the words of Trevor Bodie, been transformed into a splendid resort in danger of losing its conventional business and commercial functions altogether. Even where elements of this area's commercial past remain, such as these fishing boats, I have to agree with the assessment of Nicholas Kenny when he states that the past serves mainly aesthetic purposes in this instance. Indeed, the very fact that these boats are moored here, in spite of what must be eye-watering moorage fees, coupled with a total lack of people either buying or selling fish, would seem to suggest to me that these boats are here merely to be looked at as quaint relics of a bygone era. Further evidence that this once industrial area has been transformed into something resembling a seaside resort can be found by moving away from the seawall. Here, situated on what was once presumably a working dock of some form or other, tourists and the leisure class alike enjoy live musical performances as they sit and eat food purchased from the nearby public market itself a space that is transformed from an industrial facility to one which caters to the fine dining needs of the city's most affluent populations. It's telling that this public market is, in my experience, one of the most expensive places to buy food in the city. Having investigated Granville Island, let us now cross the city to see if similar processes are at work on the waterfront of Canada Place. Like Granville Island, Canada Place has a long history of commercial and industrial use, with much of the city's shipping activity being conducted out of this area. Other commercial pursuits include the long-standing tradition of passenger vessels, such as the Empress of India, seen here coming into dock in what is now Canada Place itself. In addition to the shipping of both cargo, such as salmon and lumber, and people around the globe, the area around Canada Place was also once known for its substantial shipbuilding capacity. In contrast to Granville Island, 
where most of the former commercial and industrial activities have ceased almost entirely, the Canada Place of today is still very much characterized by many of the same activities that it was known for in the past. The docks, in particular, are perhaps even busier than ever, although the veritable flotilla of ships that were relatively small by today's standards have been replaced by less numerous but substantially more massive container ships. Transportation also remains a key feature of the waterfront around Canada Place, with passenger vessels largely giving way to float planes providing quick links to nearby communities for the wealthy to enjoy, not to mention the cruise ships which are a regular feature of this area throughout the summer months. In a number of ways though, I found Canada Place to be very similar to Granville Island. On the one hand, the notion that Canada Place operates like a waterfront resort is highlighted by the fact that there is an entire level of the facility seemingly dedicated to the mundane aspects of the day-to-day -day operations of this cruise ship terminal slash conference center that is inaccessible to the public. This, alongside the surprising absence of the visibly downtrodden, despite this area's proximity to the downtown east side, gives the impression that this area is attempting to cultivate a very particular image, one of the idyllic seafront, with the dirtier aspects of the operation hidden from view and almost literally buried. Like Granville Island, the waterfront of Canada Place seemed to me to be a place of work transformed into a place of recreation and, particularly, conspicuous consumption. Not only are many of the people using this space dressed well and carrying shopping, but the entire area seems to me to be a place where the haves can show off their possessions and the have-nots can gawk and maybe dream just a little bit. In conclusion, we have seen that, rather unsurprisingly, significant change has occurred on the waterfronts of both Granville Island and of Canada Place. What is more significant than the fact that this change has occurred is what this change means for everyone in the city. On the one hand, the leisure class has gained a spectacular waterfront promenade that extends almost the entire way around the downtown core of Vancouver. Personally, I think that this, alongside the environmental improvements that have come as a result of lessened commercial and industrial activity along the waterfront, is an extremely positive thing for the city in general. On the other hand, though, those populations who have seemingly always been on the margins of Vancouver society, the working class, the poor, and the downtrodden, are increasingly being squeezed out of the very areas of the city that they had once laid claim to. This, I feel, is an unacceptable way to treat people who have just as much of a claim to living in the city as these people wandering the seawall on a sunny Monday afternoon in November. Like it's, a, like it's an uptight city. I'm like, oh. Vancouver's the most uptight city in the world. Uh, well, no, I don't believe that. I honestly don't even know. Oh, the daisy would have given up. 